This is Believe in Buckeyes. This show is brought to you by Bet Online. Jim, hit on with that. So Bet Online is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for everything online sports betting. Right now, you can receive a 50% free bet of up to $250 on your first deposit. To bet on anything from the Olympics to baseball to Formula One racing, Bet Online has every stat, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads while the games are being played. When the game's over, head on over to our online casino and get in on the game of blackjack or poker or unwind with one of our over 150 slot games. Head to the website today to get in on the action. Use the promo code BLEAVE for your 50% free bet credit on your first deposit of up to $250. Bet online. The game starts here. And if you have any issues with gambling, always feel free to reach out to 1-800-GAMBLER. they 24-7 help you out with anything you may need in that category. But, yes, this is Believe in Buckeyes. I'm Brian Browning with All-American quarterback, Shindy Chekwa. We have a good show for you guys today. But we took – first off, we got to address it, man. We, the, the people would want to know, man. It's like we took a week off. We went on vacation. Chim, Chim went to Aruba to celebrate that 10 years of marriage. Man, how was the island, man? It was a good time, man. It was a good time. Got to know – some of the locals got to experience mm-hmm. some natural beauty, got to experience um, just some relaxation. So, uh, yeah, it was a good time. Didn't take the kids, yeah, so, a... you know. Oh, you could have just went around the corner if you had a kid. That's <laughs> like, a, like a great time to relax. So, yeah, man, that sounds, 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 uh, sounds fantastic. Sounds like it was needed, too. That, that's always good. Always good, always good. But yeah, so on, to, on today's show here, we wanted to kind of lock in, man. As we've been speaking over the summer, obviously we've been having guys commit. We've been talking to guys from Oregon. They're still in some of our Ohio guys. And it's just kind of been wild, wild west a little bit when it comes to recruiting. Ohio State, be honest, they've been knocking out the park. It's been wild for other guys, but I guess our, our, our standards are set high. Number one class of 25. But we still feel like, as a unit, we still kind of have some work to do, and especially when it comes to the offensive of line here at Ohio State. So uh, the biggest name that's still out there that uh, Ohio State has circled on their big board is a David Sanders out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, he's not set to make his commitment date until August 17th. Uh, we know there's still a few high, big-profile uh, name guys out there still waiting to make their decision. Uh, he at least set a date. So we kind of have to wait a few weeks on that. But I guess we kind of want to address on this show, I mean, what does Ohio State off the line look like? Why do they, first of all, why do they want a guy like that so so much, right? Towards the end of the class, we got the number one class. Why are we still going so hard for a guy? And then two, you know, what do we look like if we don't land him? How's the Ohio State off the line um, kind of shake up over the next couple of years? Jim, um, obviously I know the off the line is, as we know, to be a national championship team, you have to have the, the, the play up front. Over the last couple of years, I'm um, not to say the last couple of years, last year in particular, we could have performed a little better up front as a, as a unit. Uh, but first off, I guess, what do you think about our off the line? And then how do you think we fare up? And why do you, we want this guy, David Sanders, so, so I guess, so much? Yeah, I think, I think across the board, if you ask Buckeye fans in general, at least since we – kind of corrected the defensive challenges a few years back. I think the offensive line has been, in most fans' eyes, a little bit of a sore spot. I think, um, you know, the offensive, this is one of those things where it's easy to blame the offensive line, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, for a lot of, a lot of the, the, the bad things that happen. But I think across the board, I feel like when it comes to recruiting the top guys, when it comes to, um, you know, execution in the run game, when it comes to protecting the quarterback, I think there's been um, some more to be desired from the offensive line in general. If you're just comparing them with, you know, the talent across the entire team and how the, the, the play has been. I honestly think the talent is there, so I'm, I'm not as concerned. But especially when it comes to recruiting, I feel like there's – I feel like recruiting could be better. When you look at Ohio State and you start comparing – the positions and and how you know across the board they've been able to get top recruits, high level recruits in pretty much every position. It feels like the offensive line has been lacking in comparison to those other positions. Um, and you know, I I think that's part of the reason why a guy like Sanders is like you see 
big guy, big name after big name after big name commit somewhere else other than Ohio State. I think being able to secure a guy like Sanders would um, kind of dispel some of those um, concerns across the board. And not getting them will continue that narrative of, you know, we're just not being, we're just not getting those guys at that position at the clip that we need to be, you know, who we anticipate and expect the house State. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess, you know, it's kind of, that's kind of just the nature of Ohio State right now, right? I mean, right now when it comes to, on the national level, Ohio State is known for getting, you know, essentially the top guys that, especially when you start thinking about uh, our quarterbacks, right? And how highly rated the, those guys have been coming to college. The wide receivers, I feel like like you almost have to be a five star to get an offer <laughs> for, for, to play yeah. wide receiver at Ohio State. You look at, you know, we've been talking a lot about the defensive backs in this recruiting class, and us having uh, currently the number one, number two cornerback of the nation committed, and neither neither of those guys are from Ohio. We kind of, you know, we've been having discussion on okay, where do Ohio guys fall in who are ranked really high nationally, but they're just not ranked as high as these guys. So on the offensive line, you know, we, we tend, like you say, we're just not making that national splash when it comes to a lot of our offensive linemen guys. Obviously, the unit we have now, um, Diamond Jackson being out of Texas, Simmons, uh, Josh Simmons, our left tackle being out of California. Jackson was a recruit, big-time recruit, five-star recruit coming in from Texas. But, then, you know, you talk about a guy like Simmons out of the transfer portal. You talk about our starting center this year, uh, Seth McLaughlin, out of the transfer portal. Uh, but then on the right side, you have, you know, kind of some competition at right guard or right tackle. You got Joshua Fryer, who's a who's a Ohio guy who's been on the team for uh, going into us last year. But it is just some concern. I mean, I guess when it comes down to it, uh, you just kind of start looking at the roster, right? How do we line up? So this year we have a very experienced offensive line. I imagine uh, for everything we hear about Chip Kelly, obviously we had uh, Jonathan Stewart on the show. He said he's going to make offensive line play really simple. So those guys can play really fast. And I feel like that's kind of what was is needed for this group. When you start looking at last year, it seems like a lot of times there was kind of a, a lot of confusion up front about where guys was supposed to be, what, what direction the guys was supposed to be going in. Um, and so we expect that to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, fixed this year, right? We expect the guys to know where they're going. And so we just have a lot, <laughs> you know, we have a lot of experience. You know, we talk about Josh, Fry- Josh Fryer at the right side. He just started uh, a full season at right tackle. He has many years of experience playing when he's not injured. Uh, right guard, once again, kind of that only position where it's kind of a little bit up in the air who's going to take that spot. Center, we got uh, the transfer, Seth, out of Alabama. A ton of experience. Left guard, Diamond Jackson. Essentially, he's been playing for four seasons, three-year starter there. Josh Simmons at left tackle. He started the whole season. So we have this season is really not too too much of a concern, right? We, we kind of have our guys. But then you start looking at the 26th year, which is obviously is just college football. You know, guys are going to leave. Fryer is a senior. Seth is a senior. Uh, Diamond Jackson uh, is a is a senior. Josh Simmons, he, he has two years of eligibility, but this is his fourth year of college football. So he, if he has a good year with his athletic build, it's a good chance he might want to go on and go on to the NFL as well. So now you're looking at losing potentially three or four guys off that off the line. And then, the, and then now I was like, okay, now who do we have to kind of plug in these spots? And then that's where the I'm gonna say the lack of experience is just really not there. I I I've seen the guys enough to know that we have the talent. But talent is one thing, and off the line is kind of like the mid the mentality to kind of go out there and be able to execute play after play after play. So that's where we kind of get kind of thin. And a guy like David Sanders, you know, who's essentially uh, a very athletic offensive lineman, has to build. Um, you could f- maybe figure out a way that you, where if he does commit, he could kind of get some uh, playing time right away, especially if we, if we lose two offensive of tackles off the line. It's just, you know, it's just not a ton of experience there to say that these guys that we do have on the, currently on the roster could definitely fit in, step in that role, and be able to kind of execute play after play. Yeah, and I think, you know, Ohio State, with all the talent that is committing year after year, with all the guys that are coming there, the one way within the Big Ten that you can compete with a team with this level of talent is being able to beat them in the trenches and be mm-hmm. being able – to have the line, the offensive line that may outplay Ohio State's offensive line. 
And that's really where you have to win. If you're Wisconsin or Iowa or Michigan, uh, there's still a window of opportunity uh, to do that. If you're Penn State, it's Penn State. You know, Penn State. <laughs> <laughs> Penn State is going to play the game like Ohio State, and it's just not going to be good enough. But these other teams, um, if they can sell these these offensive linemen and these these guys in the trenches on their ability to develop you, we're gonna have guys who are juniors and seniors who are you know well experienced can play, and you're gonna be behind those guys for a year, maybe two years. So it's gonna be your turn, and you're gonna be have an opportunity to be a top three round pick. Like you can, they can sell that, and they can win on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, and I haven't played the position. I haven't played offensive line. I never was uh, in my entire life big enough to to ever come close to being offensive lineman, right? But it, it it feels like overall, like it's a position that needs development, right? And yeah. in, in every in every position in football now, uh, kids are starting younger and younger. And coach, I'm coaching kids in 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 middle school uh, on how to play a cornerback position. All right, so there's a there's an opportunity for some of these guys who have the athletic ability and they already have the size when they get to Ohio State to be ready to play corner, to be ready to play a receiver, right? Um, and you know, still some development to 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 do, but you know, two three years they may be ready for the NFL. I think uh, I think an offensive line, right? It just feels like this is generally more it needs more time, right? It needs more development. And it's hard to take a big guy who's in high school who's really bigger than everybody at his school, right? This physical right. is way bigger than him. To now transition to a college where you have to guard some of the best athletes coming off the ball at the, on the defensive line. Like, that is a tough transition. And trying to just get the top guys who are, you know, five-star guys, just because they're a five-star, they still need to be able to develop and be able to play that position. So coaching is a big part of it. And yeah. you got to think these kids who are making decisions are like, you know, which one of these coaches are going to put me in the position to be a guy who can really make the jump from college to NFL, which another is, is another big league. Yeah, that's for sure. Too. I mean, I, obviously I left it, right? In high school, I think my senior guy probably listed at three six four, three hundred twenty five, three thirty. 330. Something of the sort. So, like, I go out there, and it's just, it's just, you know, you go out there and, as a as a D one off the line in high school. You try, that's the easiest football you're gonna play. You're gonna go out there, <laughs> and like you say, you're the biggest guy by far. You just kind of go out there, and it just comes to you. It's a it's a pretty natural run over for 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 the majority of the games that you play, and it's just really yeah. no, nothing else, no one else could do. But you know, obviously, I made the transition to college, and I also made the transition to play pro. By far, the toughest transition is high school to college. College to pro is, you know, it's just, you know, it's just a transition. You got to learn more. You got to know more uh, mentally, things of that nature. But physically, like you were saying, that's the big jump. Because now you're looking at guys that's your size, maybe bigger, definitely your first your first year in, definitely a lot of guys that's going to be more stronger than you, you know, weight room-wise and things of that nature. And you have to kind of understand now that, like, okay, technique really matters. Like, if I take yeah. a bad step here or if I'm a little bit late, like, this play is over with. Like, this guy's going to make the play in the backfield or it's going to be a sack or something of that nature. And you just don't have that window of opportunity to make to, to, to make mistakes. And you just kind of have to learn how to execute. Okay, for this play, I need to do this. For it to be a success, do it. Get back to the huddle or, you know, wherever. Get back to the line of scrimmage and then be able to do it again. And it kind of just takes some time. To kind of get it, and then another thing about you know that leap from high school to college is things change. Playbooks kind of change from week to week, and I know I took one year. I redshirted my first year in college to kind of catch up physically. Need in there. My second year, I probably was like the sixth off the lineman, so if anyone got injured, I probably was gonna go in the game. But that was a transition mentally, getting ready week to week because you start to kind of tweak plays a little bit. Uh, based on the defense that you're going against. And that took a, like, well, that was a, another leap that you kind of had to take. So it took me essentially two years to really kind of understand the flow to be really all the way ready to kind of go out there on Saturdays and execute. And so we were looking at our, our roster, our current roster, is, you know, after this year, we're looking at a bunch of guys with very little experience, like I was saying. You know, looking at it now um, at the off the tackle position. So let's say, 
well, let's imagine our two off the tackles play this season and leave. The next guys behind them is Zim Milowski and George uh, Fitzpatrick on the depth chart at, at the tackle position. Yeah. We have, you know, those guys are going to year th- uh, four for them, and we just we haven't seen them play, right? So we don't really know what we have there. And then behind yeah. now, as we're getting guys younger, you start looking at uh, Luke Montgomery, who was a, a high pick out of uh, Finley, Ohio. Uh, they have him listed on the depth chart as a guard. And we know, you know, from from, from spring, they had him competing at that guard position. So is he ready to play tackle? Then you start looking at the true freshman. You got uh, Deontay Armstrong out of uh, Cleveland, Ohio. True freshman. This is just going to be his first year of college football. Obviously, he came in early for the spring. So, you know, it's just not a ton of guys there that has experience that we could just know we could count on that after the 25 season, we could know we could kind of plug into these positions. So that's why it's a little bit more, more of an emphasis on the David Sanders, um, a guy from looking at him athletically, he looks like he looks the par, but obviously he has to kind of come in and learn everything that just went over, but he kind of checks a lot of boxes. That's why I probably could, see uh uh you know the team kind of doing a little bit more to get him there are a couple guys on that class but you got carter low out of the 25 class he's out of uh, toledo ohio and also jake cook uh who's out of um essentially the columbus ohio area but he's listed as a guard so once again on those edges it could get a little thin right yeah i i think that's where the, the concern comes in general is I mean, yeah, we need guys. We need to get top recruits. We need to do all that stuff. But at some point, you got to have a tackle, right? You have to have a guy. You have to have a left tackle, a guy who who can actually just move his feet and play the position. Um, and if you don't have him, you got to go get him. In the transfer portal, you got to go find a guy. And, and I think that's where you really want to get one of those top guys because now you know, now I potentially have a, a guy who fits the mold that can, that can play this position. And I'm not. it's not a liability. Everywhere else, you know, we got top guys, we got guys we can, you know, we can help continue to develop and whatever. But at some point, you need that guy who fits the profile of being able to play that left tackle position. And I think that's why it's important. Um, outside of that, I think that I think, I mean, we got I think they got enough guys on the roster. But yeah, you know, and in today's day and age, with the transfer portal, I mean, it's still it's a concern. But there's always the mm-hmm. opportunity to supplement with the transfer portal. Um, so yeah, I, sure. I think that's a that's also something that's to look the, at in future years. Yeah, that's the card in the back pocket, man. You just go get it out the yeah. portal, man. So yeah, we know how that works. Yeah. So, but also I forgot Ian Moore. Ian Moore is a good player. I meant to mention him as the offensive tackle. One of the young guys that's on the roster. I think he'd be a fantastic player to hot state. But yeah, we need let's let's talk about um. So this this past, I think this came out today, but the the media started to vote on uh, the, the conference, on who, who they felt would finish number one, and the conference kind of started ranking team. I mean, it's no surprise. Ohio State was ranked number one. Uh, number two was Oregon. Um, what's your thoughts on that list? Any surprises there uh, from the media and, and their thoughts on how, on how this Big Ten season would shake out? Yeah, I mean, I guess the one kind of surprise is it's not really, but it kind of Penn State at number three instead of Michigan at number three. But I think, I mean, three, four, I think kind of in that second tier, that's exactly where Penn State should be, like they always are. <laughs> um, outside of that, I think what well, USC was five, Iowa six. Um, I caught, I don't know, man. I caught USC at six. I thought that was interesting. Uh, Iowa was at five. Yeah, Iowa I mean, five, some of that USC stuff kind of, you know, I don't, I don't know how official all that stuff well, is. So it's kind of in that window, right? Yeah, it's to be determined. I think they're in the right tiers. I always I, I like the tiers because, I mean, you don't know exactly how it shakes out, but USC to me is the most interesting of all the teams in the Big Ten. Obviously, one, because they're a team coming from the, the pack, whatever, and coming <laughs> to the Big Ten. And it's a different style of play. They're all the way on the West Coast. they got to travel real distance to play some of these Big Ten teams. And they don't play defense. <laughs> so when, yeah. when, the, when a team doesn't play defense, you really don't know how the game's going to go, right? It's like you just don't know. Like it could be a shootout both ways. Um, it could be that USC has so much firepower that, you know, the other team can't really compete. Or they can just get beat <laughs> because you can't stop the other team. So it's going to be interesting 
um, really to see how they transition and do they improve defense. They got new, they got new defensive coach. Um, yeah. They're uh, they're doing some things there. They're still losing and recruiting in Oregon. <laughs> Guys still yeah. leave, leaving Southern California to go play elsewhere. <laughs> um, and I just don't see them. I don't see them being able to transition and get that defense to where it needs to be, to be in that second tier. So it's going to be interesting. The the Iowa yeah. team that doesn't play offense, and the USC <laughs> team that doesn't play defense. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Those, yeah, that's going to yeah. be the interesting uh, uh, battle. Yeah, it is interesting because this. I mean, this Lincoln Riley was brought in to make USC relevant again, right? And you know, obviously. You know, you had Caleb Williams, his number one draft pick, and the number one quarterback, number one draft pick. And two seasons ago, right, I mean, it was, you know, essentially, what, a couple of plays away from making the playoffs, right? And obviously, uh, they couldn't get the job done. The last season, it was once again, due to the defense, they ended up losing a few games. But, I mean, there's a lot of pressure on him. I think if you're look, talking about pressure as far as coaches in the Big Ten, he def- I mean, it's not even close. Like, he definitely has the most pressure on him to essentially – have a good season, somehow get that team into the playoffs and make his team relevant here in this new Big Ten. So it'd be interesting to see. But one more thing that hit the news today, man. I think this is this is this is this is interesting, man. So I, I never I never heard of this show. I just we kind of saw the article today. But Netflix has a show called Untold, and basically yeah. it looks like it's a um, it's like an interview of sorts. Like they kind of take interesting people and kind of kind of do a really a, a, a deep dive into like you know the story that kind of you know, why they're essentially irrelevant. And your guy, this is your guy. I'm going to say your guy. <laughs> your guy, Connor Stallions, Stallions out of Michigan, man, is set to have an episode release, I believe, on August 27th, where he's going to kind of, I don't know, more or less take a deep dive into the, the Michigan yeah. cheating scandal. Man, that's, uh, I mean, I know around here, that's kind of, that's must-see TV, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is must-see TV, and I'm excited to watch it. And I, I'm skeptical of it because one thing I learned this past year when the cheating stuff kind of came out initially, uh, the the narratives that flew across Michigan Twitter and media, et cetera, I, I, I learned that there's a lot of powerful Michigan alumni in media. It's a lot of them, a ton of them. <laughs> like all across ESPN and everything, everybody, everybody was spending the same coordinated narrative of, well, they should allow, uh, you know, earpieces in the helmet. So none of this stuff would happen. They should, like, it's like everybody is like they had a meeting and then you heard the same stuff everywhere. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if yeah. any of those alumni have, have infiltrated the Netflix uh, untold whatever story area. But, yeah, so I'm, I'm skeptical. Because, one, mm. uh, is, is he going to tell us what, what he was doing on the, the Central Michigan side of like I'm very, I'm very interested. Like he gonna tell us why he was he was on the sideline in that in that game, um, and is he gonna yeah. tell us you know what was in the manifesto? Like oh, there's a lot of questions that I'm not really expecting real answers. Well, what do you, what do you think about this? Man, I don't know, man, because I, I say like this. I, also, we had Pierre Woods, who's a Michigan alum, and you know, one, he me and him, uh, high, same high school out of Cleveland. And once again, he hit that narrative on the head. I mean, just on like the like the spot on, like boom, 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 boom. Like man, like you guys, like y'all really had a uh, y'all really sent out communications. Like this is how you speak on these points when you're if you're asked about it. But I don't know, man, because it, it feels like, and now I say I, I say it feels like, but what I'm hoping or thinking may have happened is maybe Michigan is not taking care of him. Like he feels like he should be taken care of. Obviously due to the work that he put in, Michigan goes from essentially the team is a good team to essentially being a relevant team and then win a national championship. And he has to feel like he's a huge part of that. But essentially when, the, when things hit, you know, they cut ties with him, right? They cut ties with him. Yeah. They say he's no longer a part of the program. Um, you know, obviously he's no longer with the team. He's not on the sidelines or anything of that nature. Like you've seen him previously, he's, you know, in the past, he's on the sideline with like this book and he's like whispering things into the coordinator ears before they call plays after they see how the uh, offense or defense lines up. And all of a sudden he's no longer there. Right. And then, and now all the guys that, that, that essentially that probably most likely brought him in, Harbaugh and them, they're all gone. They all went off to the NFL. They all went, you know, took separate jobs and, 
Yeah. I don't know for sure, but I don't, I don't think Connor Stallions has a, a coaching gig right now. Um, I'll be very surprised if he did. I feel like that would be big news. So he most likely, you know, is out of a gig right now. Um, so maybe, maybe this is his way to, you know, to to kind of pay something back. Maybe this way to 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 to, to reset some to, to gain some funds here. You know, speaking of Netflix and receiving a check, receiving the payment, and he maybe he's he's opening us up to things that we yeah. wouldn't even really aware of, and he kind of dives into it and and gives us some perspective on how bad things really were. Uh, up uh, up there with with Michigan when it comes to this, you know that unfair advantage that they had going into these games. Yeah, I, I hope so. I hope so. And now, honestly, Connor Stars, if you if you come across the Believe in Buckeye show, we'll like we'll love to have you on here as well. Oh man. yeah, come here. We'll give you the <laughs> give you the platform to tell your story, Buckeye fan. So we want to know. We want to know. We want to know. We want to know why you on Central Michigan sideline. We want to know what's in the manifesto. We want to know. <laughs> Were you able to call out plays before they happened? Were you able to see something and say, hey, they're running it? Was Michigan able to change the play call based on that, that intel? Um, how instrumental were you in Michigan's ability to go on a run and close it out with a, a national championship? We want to know. So We want to know. That's I can't wait to see. Know. I can't wait to That's see. That's for sure. Yeah, and before we jump off, NCAA, the game is out, man. The game is out. Obviously, I've been on, vac- I've been on a little vacation myself, but I'll get on there soon. I'm a PlayStation guy. I I, forget, I don't know my gamer tag all the time, but once I know my gamer tag, I will share it on the show. <laughs> Feel free to join. Feel free to play. I'm gonna be playing as the Buckeyes. I'm gonna be winning games because that's what I do. But you know, we, I I catch you guys here on that in a week. And another thing, in about a week or so, uh, we got real football. I think it maybe real next, football is coming. Real football. F- fall camp is opening up for Ohio State, and obviously we'll be bringing you guys all the news. Uh, that we could gather on that, giving you guys our insights and just kind of letting you know what our team is shaping out to be. So always feel free to follow us on all platforms. We've got YouTube, uh, iTunes, uh, Spotify. Uh, just kind of log in with us, be with us for the season. It's going to be a good one. I'd like to end all our shows with an OH. I-O. Go Bucks. Catch you guys next time.